it's a great pleasure actually to present on this incredibly interesting and I would actually say exciting topic. Just a little bit about our history in relation to the autonomous group that we have at HFW. We've been advising on issues in relation to autonomy for the last seven years. You'll see some of the clients that we've been advising on uh, those issues. We've also heard earlier today that generally regulation, but also law, tends to lag behind technology. And what we try and do is anticipate what legal issues there will be and write some thought leadership. And there are some examples there on the slide. Please forgive some of the titles. What we're trying to do is really get people's attention. So the rise of the machine is a shameless attempt to link us to the Terminator. Uh, lastly, we are the legal advisors to the Society of Underwater Technology. So the first question that we have to look at is whether mass are ships. The first place that you look is the Merchant Shipping Act, and the section is there. And you'll see the description is actually quite vague. I mean, what does used in navigation actually mean? In some jurisdictions, it's a lot more prescriptive. There's a list, for example. So if you look at the um, South African legislation, it will give you a list. We don't have that benefit in the UK. So what you need to do is you need to look at the types of things which the courts and other conventions have decided are relevant in the context of ships. And so far, in relation to, to mass, there is no statutory definition and there is no decided case law. So we go through this almost tick box exercise and it's not meant to be prescriptive. You just identify some which are relevant. First of all, does it float? Well, fortunately, mass float, or at least they should do, so we can tick that box. Are they fixed or moored in place? Generally, no. If they were a buoy, for example, they would not be a ship. Are they ship-shaped? Do they look like a ship? An important element of the criteria. Sail propelled. Do they have a rudder? For example, can they steer themselves? Can they navigate independently? Sea ocean going. Now we get some anomalies here, and part of them are linked to the way in which politics works in different jurisdictions. So for example, you may be surprised to learn that in the States, a seismic survey vessel for the purposes of Jones Act is not a ship. Now that is to do with um, the way in which the oil companies have persuaded legislature that they should not be ships for the purposes of the Jones Act. But then if you go to Greece, there's a case involving a ship called the Slops, which was permanently moored, and the courts found that was a ship, even though it was permanently moored. So you'll see that around the world you get different interpretation. Is it used to navigate between places? Well, yes, that's the intention of mass. Used in trade and commerce, well, you won't be surprised to learn that there is no definition of what that means. And then lastly, is it used to carry cargo? Now, the view that we've taken uh, in relation to advising on mass is that they are ships. So you then move on to what are the relevant uh, regulations and do they cover mass? Well, none of them were drafted with mass in mind. I put on the slide the two probably leading conventions which relate to um, the considerations we're thinking about. You've got the STCW, and then you've got the coal regs, which we've already touched upon earlier today. STCW, well, they would apply, but there are no seafarers on board. And then the coal regs, we've had a bit of a discussion about the coal regs already. Uh, the issue there, or the challenge there, is the inability to be able to comply with the rules relating to physical lookout. But we have the industry code and the class design code, and James is going to talk to you about that. Other applicable regulations. So this is rather a long list, 
and I won't be going through all of it, but these are the sorts of things that we have been advising clients on in relation to the relevant conventions that apply to MAS. So first of all, you've got SOLAS, then you've got the ISM code, that would be where a MAS has been registered, and we do have a vessel that's been signed up to the UK register. Load lines, uh, then you've got the tonnage measurement convention, um, that would apply if a mass is employed on international voyages and is 24 metres or over in uh, length. Then you've got MARPOL in relation to pollution. Then you've got OSPAR in relation to the protection of the environment. Paris MOU on port state control. The suppression of unlawful acts. Uh, the intervention convention. <coughs> Uh, the CLC and the Fund Convention in relation to pollution, uh, salvage convention, and probably the most important on this list, particularly from an insurance perspective, is the uh, Limitation of Liability Convention, uh, the 1976 Convention with the 1996 Protocol, on the understanding that mass are ships, they can limit their liability, and that provides insurers with the uncertainty that they need in order to uh, to write the business. And then you've got the last convention uh, on the slide there. Other regulations, you've got the dumping uh, convention, uh, that's unlikely to apply unless mass are involved in dumping. Then you've got the H&S convention, again only applicable if mass are going to be carrying hazardous or noxious cargoes. Bunker convention only apply if they're actually going to be using bunkers as fuel. We touched upon this earlier in the discussions. It could well be that mass will not be powered through the use of propulsion using bunkers, but with perhaps other systems. The Nairobi Re Removal Convention, that's another one that could apply for the larger mass. Uh, the Collision Convention uh, registration and then Leans at the moment and with the Maritime Mortgages Convention, uh, that's unlikely to apply for the moment. And then lastly, you've got UNCLOS. Uh, although there's a slight anomaly in relation to UNCLOS, and you'll see that mentioned on the slide. So the other aspect of this talk is, is standard form contracts and really whether they're fit for purpose. You've got uh, bills of lading, which are probably the most popular contracts of carriage that we see. Um, in relation to those, you've got uh, principally three conventions. You've got the Hague Rules, the Hague Visby Rules, and the Hamburg Rules. Those rules apply to goods carried on a ship, and then you've got a definition of a ship uh, there in relation to uh, those conventions. So assuming that mass are carrying goods, then those conventions are going to apply. One anomaly, of course, in relation to bills of lading is the expectation is normally that the bill of lading is going to be signed by the master, but there's not going to be a master. That, I don't think, is going to be an issue. I mean, we already have e-bills of lading. A charter party, a standard charter party, uh, one which is probably closer to my heart than any other supply time. Um, the most recent form is supply time 2017. Again, I think it's largely already fit for purpose. I put on the slide some of the clauses which could potentially be altered or deleted. And you'll see that all of them principally relate to crew. Master and crew, their duties. Um, one of the clauses in supply time allows you to remove crew, a charter to remove crew if they're dissatisfied. You've got um, drugs and alcohol policy, those sorts of things, all of which currently relate to crew. But the remainder of the contract, I think, is fit for purpose already. Unseaworthiness. The Hague-Visby rules, um, they impose a duty on the carrier um, to ensure that the mass is seaworthy. There are going to be broadly three elements to that. The, the computer technology and the shore-based controller, 
must function satisfactorily. That's the first element. Second, uh, the owners of the mass will be liable for actions and emissions on behalf of the uh, shore-based controller. And then lastly, we've already touched on this, and this is cyber attack. Um, if the systems are breached and the mass owner can't show that they've acted with reasonable care in relation to managing risks, it's likely that the mass could be unseaworthy. Lastly, error of navigation, defence, that should apply to the shore-based controller. Uh, just a final note there that that defence does not apply to the Hamburg rules. So that is a snapshot. Thank you very much. <laughs>
those that are operating and those that are operating with, near, around vessels that might be autonomous, might not be, and with new technologies. Something I want to stress is that the work that's gone into the world of autonomy, quote unquote, is having some very interesting repercussions for what I would call the conventional manned vessel. All sorts of technologies are emerging that will be available on the bridges of ships uh, in the future. In fact, some of them are already here now. So there is an al already a shift of, um, of uh, technological impact, if I can call it that, which further underscores responsible ownership. But there's a problem. If a ship sails from Southampton with a pilot human on board, with a captain human on board, and a deck crew on the bridge, who then get fallen out at Nab Tower. They either come off on a boat with a pilot, or they stay until the next harbour, whatever it is. How do you know in a vessel that that particular ship is under AL0, if you know your Lloyd's um, levels, i.e. conventional manned, or has made a switch to AL5? How do I know that from outside? You know, these are the sort of questions that we've got to start asking ourselves as we get more sophisticated. Safe operation goes without uh, uh, saying. And then one of the things that the code is all about is the recognized accreditation, training, and standards. And throughout the work we've been doing, and I'll talk in a second a little bit more about what we're doing next, uh, the human element is right there in the heart of this. And I would really ask you all to walk away today with the notion that autonomous does not mean unmanned. It does not. It might not mean unmanned on the bridge, and as I've said, not all the time. But we've got to recognize that there will be some form of human engagement in the loop, even if it's the person designing the AI system who is setting down the, um, the technology that allows decisions to be made without a human physically making that decision. And the bottom bullet I've been passionate about since uh, John rang me and said, would I take this on um, four plus years ago, whenever it was, is that just because unmanned is appearing, autonomy is appearing, does not mean to say that the rest of the maritime world has just got to budge out of the way and let these guys have a clear route. I'm vociferous about the fact that I don't believe we should have dedicated lanes or any of that. Sea time, maritime navigation, use of the sea will never allow it. So I'm very anti the notion that an autonomous, unmanned vessel needs somewhere special to go. There may well be areas where they're operating under the usual notes to mariners and all the other stuff that goes on, but the fact is that they must do their business and find their way into the community sensibly. Now I put, um, thank you very much guys for the early morning call this morning, just a few examples of the sort of vessels that um, are out there today. The top three are Brit, the Autonaut, the Sea Kit International, and um, Dan's ASV Sea Sweep. I hope that's a current picture, Dan. Um, uh, the one in the middle is interesting because that's the first example where a U or a MASS, a USV surface vessel, is actually deploying specifically to launch autonomously an UUV which it has now done successfully and recovered it on the high seas. And um, the sea kit are trailblazing on that. But down there, you heard it referred to by Roger earlier, there's the tug in Copenhagen. As a seagoer, if you'd asked me whether a tug was a likely candidate for an autonomous uh, unmanned ship, I would have laughed. If you talk to the Mess Switzer guys about it, the guys who really had a problem with this were the tug masters. Now, you have to drag them out of their offices, I'm told, by uh, the likes of Rodi and co at Mask. And um, on the right, I shoved a, uh, an interesting uh, Kongsberg example, purely to put a bit of flesh on the fact that at the smaller end of the market, this is all happening. Now, challenges. The application of it. How do you apply this? Let us not forget the role of the flag states. So when you hear people talk about short sea, of course, that is in many ways much easier to delineate if you're inside uh, national waters, let's call that 12 miles off the coast. Common standards. We'd love to see these, but the reality is that if you go on the bridge of any ship, you'll find different bits of equipment, 
different standards that are being applied. You know, I won't take you to the ECDIS debate, but that should be our goal, one of them anyway. Consensus. Well, the mere fact that IMO take the scoping exercise forward um, at MSC 99 is a really strong demonstration of international consensus. I haven't met anybody who doesn't think that they're doing the right thing. They may have criticisms about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. That's not my po point. But the reality is that there is a global consensus, um, and it's out there. We've got to be flexible. We've got to, whatever happens, because IMO are looking at it, doesn't mean to say that the show stops, because in the time it's going to take, even in two biennials, if you speak IMO language, that's four years, so much is going to have changed in innovations. We've got to let that process flow through. And the other thing is, we've got to build mutual trust. And that I particularly would highlight with the likes of ITF, who've written some very interesting papers recently, i.e. the uh, trades, uh, the trade federations, and so on and so on. There are some quite legitimate concerns about the future of the humans and what they do and how they do it. Legal precedents, you've just had a, a good expose of all this. But the reality, even in the mass world, is that we're building case law day by day by day. And we shouldn't forget that. And the reality is that we're not having accidents at the moment. Um, I know of one that has gone to a local court. And that was a very small incident between an autonomous thing and actually somebody on a, um, a recreational jet ski type um, affair. But um, we are building a massive database. And the bottom one I always stick in there, the education of mariners, it's all about trust. People out there need to understand how these things work. They need to know far more than they do now, and we've got to all corporately help them to understand it. So let's talk about the codes. Um, you've heard that we produced uh, two, um, the code of conduct and uh, the uh, code of practice. The whole idea was to get pan-industry agreement on uh, certain aspects for mass development, design, production, and operation, to try and have a first go. It may not be right in every regard. I accept that. But to have best practice where we can already identify it, and I would stress that both codes are in uh, course of change, particularly the code of practice. Assurance. What we were trying to do when we wrote this was to put people's nerves at bay and say, look, we are giving this some very serious thought, we recognize a lot of the concerns, and to reassure, perhaps more than assure, people who are out there doing their stuff in ships that this thing is worth doing. We wanted to make it absolutely clear that it behoves all of us, and that, I would say, stretches right into your end, the city end, to those of us who are out there at sea in ships. We wanted to talk about training, conduct, personal responsibility, Compliance, self-regulation, that's why it's an industry-led, thank you to Maritime UK for picking it up in the code, and part of today is improved comms within the industry and the wider maritime community. So let me just bounce it on. There they are. I do have a couple of copies of the code of uh, practice if anyone would like to pick one up today. Otherwise, it's on the Marine Industries Alliance website, and you can download it. That's version one. What version 2 will have in addition is the work we're doing right now on registration and identification, key point, and we're working very closely with the MCA ship registry team, which is great, and there is a consensus there of where we need to go, and uh, that hopefully will be uh, embedded in version 2. And the other side of it is uh, what started out as demo and test areas, and now slightly broader, the whole business of operational areas, um, to reflect the fact that you know we're not we're moved moving past the age of just demoing and constant testing we're now in the period if you talk to Dan and you'll hear more today um, you know he's actually taking stuff out to just maybe try one little system on a vessel that's already being marketed here or overseas but uh, that's really uh, what I wanted to uh, highlight And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Britta said, my name is Catherine Rees, and I work um, at the UK Department for Transport. Um, I'm part of the Maritime Environment Technology and Innovation team, and part of my job is quite an exciting job to be thinking about the future 
and the future of the maritime industry. And part of our job as a team is to understand which technologies and innovations we see reshaping and forming the maritime sector of the future. Now, I will highlight that this is um, an extremely exciting policy area with strong ministerial support from our Secretary of State, our new Shipping Minister, Nusrat Ghani. They're all extremely excited about this. The Secretary of State definitely does recognise that there is a business and technological uh, revolution underway, and the use of data and smart shipping infrastructure is at the heart of this. Um, I will make the point today that the, this policy area is part of a, a wider government agenda. Um, you'll all be aware of the industrial strategy that was recently published. And um, the two, that then in this document, the government has recognised and, and um, identified four um, key social and economic challenges that will be affecting society going forwards and the future of mobility and the future of AI and robotics are inevitably um, intrinsically linked to our work on smart shipping and highlight how automation and digitisation are at the heart of um, the government's uh, agenda going forwards. So I'm going to briefly speak about the department's um, smart shipping vision and our approach to this policy um, for the future. Um, we're working very closely with our strategy team who are developing a long-term vision for the whole of the industry which will set out a clear ambition as government for our, our future of the, the maritime sector. The Maritime 2050 document, which I know James has already referred to this morning, um, is, is looking um, holistically across the sector and um, is going to highlight how we see um, the, the UK maritime sector continuing to be a world-leading maritime nation. As part of this, there will be six key strands of work, um, namely technology, skills, infrastructure, trade, security and safety. And our work on maritime technology and smart shipping will inevitably form a huge part of that going forwards. But I think despite us uh, producing lots of glossy vision documents and, and strategies and policies, we, we know that, that change is already happening and we're, we're clear that the UK needs to be ready for that change and ready for autonomy. Um, we see a role in collaborating with you as an industry and in ensuring we have the right skills, infrastructure and a regulatory environment to capitalise on the benefits that, that autonomy and smart shipping has to offer. DFT is ambitious, we're under no illusions about that, and we're working to set a vision where the UK maritime sector is heading, um, whereabouts we're heading in terms of technological change, and ensuring, as I say, that we're able to capitalise on all those benefits and ensure that the UK is a global leader in smart shipping. So I hope I've already made the approach today, and I think by the fact that, that um, Britt and her team have invited government to speak, that. I think government and industry working in partnership and collaborating on this is essential. We are under no illusions that in order to realise the benefits of smart shipping, um, that we're going to require technical expertise, we're going to require industry expertise, there's going to be a need for strategic and policy direction and a whole lot of engagement with industry. No one department, individual, group, organisation can deliver this alone. And our, and our concern is that without this coordination and partnership and working together, we're going to fail on, on um, achieving this ambitious vision. And we, we are at risk of falling behind our international competitors who are already making great pathways in this field. There's a role on, on, on government here in particular to capitalise on our relationships already within the department and across government to ensure that we're, we're tackling this um, policy cross-modally um, so learning lessons from the aviation, from the roads, from the rail sector and being able to take on board some of those lessons learned, be it from a legislative, from a, a regulatory point of view and um, tackling these issues cross-modally. We see a, a clear role um, for government to ensure that we're bringing necessary stakeholders together. So I'm now briefly going to speak about our, our approach to this uh, as part of our Smart Shipping Work Programme. You'll see we've got two key strands of work there, our, our policy lead and our regulatory um, approach to this. 
We, we indeed rec recognise the importance of regulation and exploring regulatory change in this area. And so you'll see that um, as a, a department, we are leading on that, um, the policy approach, and working very, very closely with our colleagues at the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, which, as I'm sure you know, is an agency of DFT and the regulatory body for UK shipping. I must highlight that this, bit, this split here is, is only notional, and, and in reality, DFT and MCA are, are one team working collaboratively on this. Um, you'll note there that many of the work streams that, that are highlighted there are tie into wider work programmes that are being done across the Maritime Directorate. And it's our job as, as a Maritime um, Technology and Innovation team to ensure a lot of collaboration and a joined up approach to, to this policy area. So um, here, um, this is a kind of a programme of, of works and a timeline for us over the next year, but I, I would highlight that this is by no means the start of government engagement on this policy area. Um, DFT and colleagues at MCA have been thinking about this for, for a, quite a long time now, and um, this, this only marks the, this, the beginning of our development of our smart shipping route map. And on the back of that, we saw the need to engage in a lot of strategic stakeholder engagement, and we're undergoing that now, and that'll take us right up until the summer. Um, alongside this, we'll be feeding into the work of the MSC 99 committee, which will be um, meeting at the IMO in, in May and in December this year. And all of these, these work streams tie into the final publication of our smart shipping route map later this autumn. So I'll now speak to you um, a little bit about our Maritime Autonomy Futures Lab, which I was extremely proud to be involved with, which took place at the end of February. I know that many of the, you in the room, um, we were delighted to be able to attend this uh, uh, stakeholder engagement workshop. And um, we, we saw the Futures Lab as an opportunity to bring together a wide range of stakeholders from across the industry. And I think it's safe to say with varying views and differing views and varying levels of appetite um, on autonomy. Um, I, I hope everyone can agree that it was, it was an engaging day, it was a very interesting day and quite an innovative and novel approach to policy making. Um, as a policy team, we saw it as an opportunity to establish the challenge for government in this field of, of smart shipping and maritime autonomy and articulate our role as a government in the sphere and in this space going forwards. We teamed up with the policy lab team at Cabinet Office, who offer quite innovative techniques to develop policy, um, to develop policy and government strategy collaboratively with industry. I'm sure a lot of you can agree that it, it was quite an unusual day with quite a few unusual activities, but these were educational activities um, which we were able to learn a lot from and, and, and a lot of key takeaways for us. I think there was a clear need um, uh, and, and a clear desire for the UK to take a leading role in, in creating an environment in which this sector can flourish, be that through legislative development and the creation of um, uh, enhancing regulatory frameworks. I think um, one thing that, that is coming up, uh, up again is the need for a government industry partnership in ensuring we exploit the potential um, uh, benefits of uh, smart shipping and technological developments within this field. There is um, a desire for government to provide leadership and supply a narrative which will highlight the long-term future vision for the maritime sector. And we hope through our work feeding into the Maritime 2050 strategy, there's some reassurance that we are looking at doing this. I think um, everyone would agree that there is a real desire for the UK to be a world leader in this field, but we need to leverage this ambition, and this is crucial that we all work collaboratively in ensuring that we can maximise the, the opportunities here. Um, I think there's been a, a few references to it already this morning, but um, we need to be considering the whole of the maritime sector when we approach smart shipping and, and looking at this sector holistically. I think there's a need ensuring we engage every one of those key stakeholders to create a real business case and ensure that we can leverage the um, profit profitability out of these smart shipping technologies and create um, and highlight the commercial opportunities they may bring to the sector. Um, James made the point, and I'm glad he did, that education, skills and people are going to be at the heart of smart shipping. And this revolution isn't only technological, it is people-based as well. 
And um, many of you in the room will have, have noticed that um, there, there is a desire to create flagship projects, um, both industry and government working collaboratively to help showcase the best of the UK maritime sector and foster those connections and relationships that already exist and being able to work collaboratively to promote the UK sector across the globe. So I know it's always uh, quite daunting to kind of promise about what government's going to deliver in the next few uh, few months and years, but I, I think I'm, I'm just going to briefly touch upon that now and what kind of highlight the key next steps for us as a, a department. So I think um, we're all in agreement that maritime autonomy and smart shipping is already happening in, in varying forms in the UK and across the globe already. And we were extremely delighted to see some of the press coverage, um, the, the positive and very ambitious press coverage, post our Futures Lab back in um, February. And that's kind of, uh, we we're kind of promising us to, to deliver a lot of, of things by the end of the year, but we're, you know, we've got a very ambitious ministerial team and, and we're hoping we, we can be working on that and delivering that successfully. Um, as I've mentioned, by November this autumn, we are hoping to publish our Smart Shipping Route Map which will establish the government's approach and vision for smart shipping going forwards. Um, as part of that, and, and, and picking up on the feedback from the Futures Lab, there were some key work streams um, for smart shipping policy. Um, so skills, infrastructure, technology, regulation, and the need to create a collaborative um, and uh, a strategic vision for um, government. Um, as part of this, we'll be engaging in a very much targeted stakeholder engagement going forwards and, and be picking up with many of you individually and as part of your organisations going forwards. Um, we're, we're still considering the best way to do this, but um, it's, it's most definitely a work in progress. We are continuing to um, explore um, working with industry to exploit these flagship projects that are already in, in development and we'll be picking up with many of you in that regard going forwards. And lastly, um, we are responsible for ensuring a, a coordinated um, approach with the wider Maritime Directorate Strategy Team to ensure that technology, smart shipping and um, maritime autonomy um, feature and play a key role in that government strategy. So I'd just like to thank you very much um, for the opportunity for inviting government to speak today and for listening to what I have to have today. I think in summary, we can all agree that it's an exciting time to be part of the sector and we're looking forward to collaborating with you more going forwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.